We well, all had a marathon good day, I hear. We, we are. We, we have, and we still are. And uh, in fact, James is uh, a former Southern, well, I don't know you're for, it's like, Still I'm not a Southern Baptist. A, well, you're still Southern Baptist, but you're also you been a preacher. In fact, he was the the head of Falls Creek in Oklahoma. He and I have a few things in common. We both grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, he ran a uh, a youth camp. I got kicked out of one, and so uh, we got a lot in common. Uh, but Falls Creek's the largest Baptist uh, camp in the the, the the country. In fact, the it's galaxy. the largest. It's actually the galaxy, it, largest in the galaxy. It is. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty big. I bet, uh, what's 45 seconds like there? <laughs> yeah. Never mind, you missed that one. Uh, no, I heard uh, it. Oh, okay, all right. I'm, I'm going to try to claim that same 45 seconds. Okay. Yeah. So the issues that uh, we deal with in Congress, and, and you've been leading on the, on the life issues, but I, I, before we get into the issues, you know, we've been talking about getting involved. We've been talking about praying. We've been talking about voting. We've been talking about standing. Uh, why did you get involved in politics? Why did you run for office? Having very successful in the ministry, seeing lives changed through uh, the youth camp, what led you to politics? Yeah, so my, my bride, Cindy, right there of 30 years, is sitting right there on the front row. She, she would say uh, that this is life's greatest interruption for us. Uh, this is not what we expected. Uh, when I proposed to Cindy 30, over 30 years ago now, uh, I didn't say, hey, let's get married, have kids, and go to Congress one day. Uh, we were doing ministry. Uh, that's what we assumed we were going to do the rest of our life. And God completely interrupted our life in 2008 and 9, and called us to be able to run for Congress. And we both independently heard that. We weren't involved in anything political at all. I was a youth pastor. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that scares you or encourages you that there's a youth pastor in the Senate. Uh, depending on your relationship with your youth pastor is going to depend on uh, what your perspective is on that. Uh, but for us, we both independently heard God call us to be able to do this. We share it with each other, and we start working through this journey thinking this is the craziest thing ever. And we thought th th this has to be just the fervor of the election and everything else because we're tracking all those things. But I'd never run for any political office. I, I didn't even run for student council. Okay, this was just no politics at all. I was a voter. I was engaged in the issues. I was the nerdy kid that read the newspaper growing up. I mean, all of those things, uh, but not any kind of elected office. So when God called us to do this, we spent uh, several months just struggling with this. And initially, it was just so clear that we thought, we're, we're going to be faithful and we're going to pray about this. And I honestly thought at that moment, this is like Abraham and Isaac that we're going to go to the top of Mount Moriah and God's going to say, thanks for being faithful to pray about anything, but you don't have to do this. <laughs> Instead, we got to the top of Mount Moriah and he said, oh no, we're killing Isaac this time. Okay. <laughs> this, this, your, your career and all the things you thought you were going to do. Oh no, it's, it's going away. And so we resigned at the end of camp in 2009 and announced to everybody that we're running for Congress. And half of our friends said, is this a joke? And the other half said, that's a fantastic idea. How can I help? And people just jumped in. And what we found immediately after doing ministry and mission trips and fundraising and all the things that we were doing in ministry, we immediately found there was a portion of the church that would say, what can I do to get godly leaders? And the other portion that said, that's such a dirty place. Why are you doing that? You're leaving the ministry. Uh, why would you ever do that? And it was just fascinating for me to be able to see and suddenly interact with people that I thought I knew them, but to be able to learn something different about them. And so we, we quite frankly, just started loving and encouraging people and pushing back a little bit and said, you, re you realize 36 of the 39 books of the Old Testament were written to, by, or about a political leader. 36 of the 39 books. A third of the pages of the New Testament, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, were written to a political leader, Theophilus. And when you look at Saul, when he struck blind going to Damascus, he struggles his way in and for three days is fasting and praying and trying to figure out what to do. And God speaks to Ananias and says, go lay your hands on this guy. And Ananias says, God, do you know who this guy is? He's a bad guy. He came to kill us. And God said, no, I know who he is. He's my chosen instrument to the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Gentile kings. 
And then he spends the rest of the book of Acts going to preach in the synagogue, getting kicked out, going to the Gentiles, and ending up in front of political leaders over and over and over again. God has a passion yep. for what's happening in government because government affects people, and he cares about people. Well, Senator, I remember when you were first elected and you came to the House. You first were in the House of right. Representatives. And I remember when I first met, I, I was looking for Charlton Heston with that voice. Yep. Uh, I was trying... Everybody thinks that I should swap bodies or voices with Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to move right along. <laughs> that group is laughing because they know I'm right. Yeah. God calls people yeah. to government, you, as you and Cindy, and we've traveled together. In fact, right. my wife and your wife, we've been to Israel together. And, and you've done some remarkable things to help in Israel in the policy front that wouldn't have gotten done uh, had we not had a, someone who understands the biblical foundation of those issues. But God calls men and women to these offices. And I've, one of the, re, one of the things that encourages me that people will not read in the paper, you're not gonna read in the paper because they don't want you to be encouraged, but God is calling more and more women and men of deep faith to Washington, D.C. So when God's finished with the city, he calls people out. He doesn't send them in. Right. And, and have you've seen that. I've seen that. And I've said that exact same thing to a lot of folks. I've said it's Sodom and Gomorrah at the end. He's pulling everybody out. He's still sending people in. So that would tell me God's not written D.C. off. He's still sending people into the fight there. So we shouldn't write off what he hasn't written off. So I, I look at this in several ways. One is I'll have people come catch me and they'll say, I couldn't work with the people you work with because I'd slap somebody and I'd get in trouble. I hear that all the time from folks. And I'll usually smile at them and say, i tell you what you do. Those are the people that I work with. That's also my mission field. Why don't you pray for them? And let me tell you a little bit about their situation and their family. That's my mission field. And we, we, I know it may sound shocking, but I encourage people of faith to pray more than we complain. And we tend to gripe about politics, but not really pray for those that are in the middle of the fight and, and ask God, what's my part? I mean, that, that's the most basic element of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah opens with Hannah and I coming back from Jerusalem and Nehemiah saying, what's it like there? I, you know, it's, it's 150 years since the fall of the city and they're probably both slaves. And he looks at him and says, what, what's it like there? And Hannah and I goes, oh, it's terrible. The people live in disgrace. The walls are down. The gates are burned with fire. It stinks. And Hannah and I walks away. And Nehemiah starts praying and says, God, this is terrible. What should I do about it? I mean, it's two people, same situation. One gripes and walks away. And the other one says, what am I supposed to do? I... I really believe we need more Nehemiahs and few, fewer Hananiahs, but my fear is we have a lot of Hananiahs that are saying, gosh, it stinks, and walking away. But as Nehemiah prayed, God gave him a plan, yeah. and they rebuilt in 52 days the walls, yeah. a, a fantastic I think it was heat. actually 56. 56? I think it was. Okay. Yeah. All right. It was, uh, it was 56. It's pretty close. Church of God moments. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about God is still bringing men and women into Washington, D.C., so he's not finished with our nation's capital. I would, by extension, say he's not finished with our nation. Right. And on June 24th, when the Supreme Court overturned a case that they decided 49 years ago, Roe right. v. Wade, that also communicates, I believe to yeah. me, an extension of God's grace that says, I'm not finished with this nation yet. Yeah. I 100% agree. And what's interesting is we, 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 we hesitate looking backwards on it to say, how did that happen? That happened actually in an election of 2014 in the Senate. That's where that happened, where the Senate flipped and turned and a whole group of folks were called in and we had no idea where those folks were coming from. I was part of that group that we saw from just multiple states and multiple places. And everybody kind of wondered what, what's going to happen as a result of that. What was going to happen as a result of that was actually three Supreme Court justices and it flips and it was a simple shift. And th none of us could ask any of the Supreme Court justices. And I met with all three of them privately in my office. To be able to, none of us would get a straight answer of where are you going on Roe v. Wade? We all asked. None of us got an answer on it. But all we could get is I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to follow the Constitution. 
And for us, there was a heartfelt belief that if you follow the Constitution, there's nothing in the Constitution that says anyone has the right to kill their own child. There's, there's nothing in the Constitution about that. There's nothing in the Constitution that says individuals are only individuals if I get to see them with my human eyes. That's not true. And so we prayed and we worked and we put people in and then we see a results of that years later. Now, the, the challenge that we have on the Dobbs decision is there's a whole bunch of people in the church that think, okay, the job's over, <laughs> done. I'm like, no, it's not done. Right. It's only really begun. We're at the end of the beginning on this fight for life. This is the moment now that it moves back to every single person. Uh, what I try to remind people all the time is abortion is, a le is legal in America right. right now. And so in my state in Oklahoma, we're, we were the first state that actually stepped up and said, we believe every single child is valuable. We don't think some children are valuable and some children are disposable. We think all children are valuable and we're gonna protect every single life. And we actually stepped out first on that, fully understanding that next door in Colorado, they're gonna do abortion tourism in Colorado. They're gonna open up resorts and say, come here, you can't get an abortion in Oklahoma, so come here and to be able to do it. So our job is still engaging with every one of those moms, talking about the value of life and talking to her about her child and about that we'll walk with you as the church. We'll walk with you as families and communities. We're not going to abandon you in this. Uh, it's the state actually enforcing laws on, um, um, uh, for the deadbeat dads, quite frankly, to be able to not walk away from these moms and expose them to all the risks that, they, that they're gonna face in the days ahead. But those things are still something we can actively engage in. Uh, right. I tell people all the time, if we're gonna talk about life, we need to be able to live it out and work one life at a time to be able to convince people into engaging in the things that are just and right. Right now, more than ever, we've gotta have those conversations so that we can win the hearts and minds because as you said, this now goes back to the states. Every state. And of course, Oklahoma, probably one of the reddest of the red states. In fact, Governor Stitt's gonna be here tomorrow. He signed yeah, you'll you know, enjoy one of the strongest pro-life pieces of legislation in the nation. Here's what I think, James, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but- It's 56 days. 56 days, okay. <laughs> I believe that as these states embrace biblical truth as it pertains to life, that I believe God's gonna bless those nations, those, so. those states. As those states come in alignment with God, I believe it's gonna be a testimony to the rest of the nation. Again, another sign of God's mercy that he will pour out his blessing on those that choose to walk in his way. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And, it, and that's, that's, not, that's not some radical principle just for people to be faithful and for God to bless them. I mean, it's just the most basic principle of all. Uh, as, as funny as it sounds, we've experienced a big drought in Oklahoma. The week after, the week after we, we passed this law to be able to protect the lives of children, we had the most overwhelming rainstorm that came across the state. And it was such an interesting conversation among people in the church like, did that just happen? Did, did that just occur? But we, we just see it in the lives of individuals. And it's not just over us as a state, and it's not just prosperity, and we're going to have no. more businesses and all that kind of stuff. It's each individual family. Quite frankly, I, I tell folks all the time, people struggle with thinking about, can I bring this child in right now? I'm, I'm struggling with poverty. I'm struggling with you know, this guy left me and everything else. And I go, wait, wait till you look in that child's eyes. Yeah. Wait till you look in their eyes. And you'll personally see the blessing that's coming. I mean, I think this is a moment of choosing for, for every American, for every state. So as we look going forward, what do we need to be doing in the church? You've touched on some of them, but what are the top three things you believe we need to be doing? Yeah, on the, on the issue of life, it really is engaging in those moms, engaging in those relationships and putting out the word and laying out a sense of hope. Um, I, I've said to people all the time, I, I, I can't believe we as a nation at one time called some people three-fifths of a man. Yeah. I, I, I can't even process that, but we did that as a nation. 101 years ago, my wife could not have voted. Not that she's 101 years old, don't, don't take that, so yeah. <laughs> she looks pretty uh, good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 101 years she ago, sure my, my, my sure wife, my daughters, my mom, they, they, they couldn't have voted. We did that as a nation and said you gotta be male to be able to vote. We rounded up people of Japanese descent during World War II and put them in internment camps. We did that. And we look back on those times in our history and we're embarrassed that we did that as a nation. I think in the days ahead, yeah. the next generation will look back at this generation and say, I can't believe they took the life of children because they were inconvenient. 
I, I can't believe they did that. So I think laying out a sense of hope is really important on this. Engaging in practical issues. I tell people all the time, people come up to me and they say, what can we do? What can I do? And I'll look at them and say, run for school board. And they'll say, what else could I do? I was like, why don't, why don't you run for school board? So many people say, I want to go to Congress. Now, God called us to be able to go there, and it's intimidating and wonderful all at the same time. Do what God has called you to do, and don't be shocked if he calls you to run for school board, city council, or don't be shocked if somebody around you is in a leadership role and God places you in that encouragement role to say, this is where I want to be able to put you because there's a task there. And the, the third thing, as odd as it sounds, really comes from me personally in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, when he was organizing the city, and everyone says, how did he rebuild the wall? And it might have been 54. I don't think it was 52, but I think it was 56. Anyway, so, anyway, so, wait, when he's rebuilding. It, it the, was the, the, a pretty short the, period the, of time. Yeah, the, the wall has been down 150 years at that point. And literally, the people had lived in Jerusalem. And for, probably sat around and talked about, hey, why don't we rebuild it's that terrible, wall? yeah. But 150 years, generations had lived next to a fallen down wall. The elements were all there. They just hadn't done it. And Nehemiah organizes everybody and says a simple thing. Build the section next to your house. Right work right there. And so what I tell people in the church is, everybody's always wanting to go somewhere on that. I was like, why don't you work on the section next to your house? If everybody does that, yeah. the challenge that we face in the nation right. is very different. Yeah. We got to this issue of being able to rebuild a culture of life really because of our constitution. You just, I want to go back to what you were saying about the Supreme Court justice when they were nominees that they said, I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow the constitution. Yeah. This coming Saturday is constitution, constitution day. day. Mm -hmm. The constitution is important. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a bit, I'm going to stand up. Can I do that? You can I'm going to talk up. about the constitution. Yeah. I'm going to stand up a little bit. Okay. I, I'm getting my preacher mode on it. Go right ahead. And I'm going to let you take um, up the offering. So let, 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 have at it. You, you, you look up on the wall, uh, rebuild, and, and check that while I'm doing this. Um, <laughs> you already checked it? 52? I'll publicly That's admit. Right. You can take me to dinner. Yeah. All okay. right. There are about 300 Chick-fil-A's in town, so. All right. Okay. I'll even get you a shake at the end. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Y'all, l l l listen, the, the Constitution Day, is, as Tony mentioned here, that's this Saturday. I run into people all the time now in the culture, especially those folks that are in their 20s, and they'll say, Congress is not working, everybody's yelling at each other, the White House is overstepping all of its bounds, I think the judges are too political, and then they'll end with, this is not working. Now, careful. Because the next step of that is, if this doesn't work, what does? And most of that younger generation is saying, let's try socialism instead. That's working so well in Europe. Let's do that. Now, I say that to us to say, we complain about what's happening in government. A younger generation hears it, and they think, yeah, this is not working, so let's do something else. Our problem is not our constitution. Our problem is we're not following it. Yeah. That's our problem. We have the we have the oldest constitution in the world now. Think about that. We have the oldest functioning constitution in the world. Our constitution, put together by our founders, I believe God led in that, put together a structure in a system that has made us the most prosperous, most moral nation in the history of the world when we follow it. The checks and balances, the separation of powers, the uniqueness of all of that is powerful in how we actually apply this into our lives, into our communities. But let, let me just say one thing to you that I think we have lost. What is the first word of the United States Constitution? We. we. Hang on. I have a lot of folks in my state that'll catch me at different times and they'll catch me at Walmart walking around or somewhere at a restaurant or out and about or whatever it may be and they'll poke me in the chest and they'll say, you work for me. You need to do what I say to do. You work for me. And I try to smile at them and say, actually, I work for we. 
because this selfish attitude has become more and more prevalent that the whole world's about me. And the power of our Constitution began with this very simple principle of we. There is this moving belief among even among conservatives and among conservative Christians that are saying, we're going to get people elected and they're going to impose this on the nation. Washington doesn't change the country. The country changes Washington. We affect Washington when we influence those folks around us. This is not imposition. This is not a dictatorship. It's we. And as we watch the culture collapse, we should ask the question, where's the salt? Because the meat by nature goes bad when salt is not doing its job. The we part of our Constitution is a big deal. This nation's not about selfishness. This nation's about we and how we engage to be able to move ideas and issues. It's also about disagreement. Uh, this may shock you, but there are some people in D.C. I disagree with. Shocking. <laughs> I don't get to impose things on them. I've got to move them in a set of ideas. I don't know about you. No one's ever come and yelled at me and convinced me of anything. Maybe you're different. Maybe come, people come and scream at you, and that sways you. It doesn't. I'm just stubborn enough that if somebody comes and yells at me, I just give them the Heisman. I'm like, see ya. Okay? Because that's not who... who moves me. We got to convince people. That's facts. That's details. That's loving people. That's not out hating people. The left believes I can silence people of faith by out hating them. If I can quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., hate doesn't overcome hate. Love does. It's a biblical principle as well. We need to live the Jesus principles to be able to influence our culture and to engage in a culture to be able to turn around a nation. Because I do not believe we're going to elect enough people to sway the nation. The nation is going to have to influence the people around them and then that group of people elect people that share their values. Does it work? Absolutely it works. I have folks that catch me at times and they'll say, you came out of ministry and you talk about your faith all the time. And I would say, you know why? Because there's a whole bunch of folks in Oklahoma that live that way. There's also a whole bunch of folks in Oklahoma that don't. And I still have a responsibility to be able to live my faith and to be able to speak truth in those areas. But we have to do this. Please don't elect people to do your job. We have to pray, vote, and stand. We have to engage in cultural conversations. We have to convince our neighbors of things. We, some of you, need to run for office in different places. We need to get busy doing the task that God has set us to do. This is still we, and you're a part of we the people. Now, clearly you're passionate about this or you wouldn't be here tonight. But we can't lose track of that very simple principle. We do this. Not someone else. We do. So if you're on the sidelines, get in the game. We need your help in the days ahead. I couldn't be more grateful to be able to be here, Tony, and I really mean that. This is a significant group of folks that are passionate, that do pray, vote, and stand, or they wouldn't be here. You've got a lot of folks that engage with you, both on radio and all the videos and everything else that you put out there, to be able to engage in the issues. So I'm honored to be, able to be part of that we but for each of us, we should be able to answer the question, who have you led to Christ? Who have you influenced for good? What have you done personally to be able to turn a culture around? Where is the salt doing its job starting at your house? Or if I can just quote Nehemiah again, which part of the wall is yours? Because we need your help in it. So God bless you and thanks for allowing me to be able to be here. Thank you. Yeah. We are about to wrap up tonight, but before we do, I would like you to join me in praying for Senator Lankford and his wife, Cindy. Cindy, would you join us up here? Yeah, this is a we thing for us as well. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. 
I know how that works. We can't do it alone. And if you would, just extend your hand toward them. If you feel comfortable doing that, I want to pray for them. Thanks, John. Father, I thank you for your servant, James, and for Cindy. I thank you for their friendship, and thank you, Lord, for uh, the relationship that we have. But I thank you, Lord, for your call upon their lives, and Lord, for his boldness and courage and consistency in sharing your truth in season and out of season, where it's welcomed and where it's not. I thank you for his consistency. And I pray, Lord, for refreshment, for encouragement, for favor. And, and Lord, just pray that you would continue to increase his influence as he remains faithful to you. And so, Lord, make their time together special, those few moments that they're able to capture here and there as, uh, Lord, there's so many demands on him. But, Lord, renew their energy, renew their strength, and may they walk in the power of your anointing, and may the joy of the Lord be their strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks Good to see you. 